Hi, and welcome to this episode of Fact Heist. Today, we'll talk about narcolepsy. A very disturbing sleep disorder some people can have for life. The term, narcolepsy, comes from the Greek, narke, meaning numbness, and lepsis, meaning attack. So literally, an attack of numbness. The word narcolepsy was first used in 1880 by French Dr. Jean-Baptiste Edward Gelino, who was also, as a French dude, obviously a wine producer. How old are you? Eight. Plebeien. Narcolepsy is a neurologic disorder, some kind of hypersomnia that affects one in 2,000 people worldwide. It often starts in childhood, usually between age 10 and 25, and equally affects both men and women. Hi, I'm Carol. I have narcolepsy. It's, it's a sleeping disorder. It isn't the worst thing you could ever have. I'm just not allowed to fly an airplane or, or drive a car or work, work in a gun range. <laughs> it often starts off with the daytime sleepiness type of shit, which could feel refreshing at first, but only for a few hours or less, and then later on, the other symptoms follow. Narcoleptic people can be described as never fully awake, nor fully asleep, they kind of leave a life in the, in between, no matter what amount of sleep they can get at night. As a matter of fact, this long-term neurological disorder is about a decreased ability to regulate sleep and wake cycles. Narcolepsy is a chronic condition, with people typically displaying two main symptoms. The first thing is excessive, sudden and irresistible daytime sleepiness. What's the other? Excuse me? What's the other thing? The other is the sudden falling episode, or cataplexy. But more on that later. This debilitating disturbance is often brought on by strong emotions. Strong emotions like laughter, <laughs> annoyance, anger, or even being emotionally upset. It's really incalculable. There are two types of narcolepsy, classified as type 1 and type 2. Narcolepsy type 1, aka narcolepsy with cataplexy. Epic fail! And type 2, it's narcolepsy but without this cataplexy thing. But according to the almighty DSM-5, only type 1 is referred as the real deal. Type 2 is just classified as hypersomnolence disorder or some shit. So we will focus only on type 1 obviously. The main symptoms someone suffering from narcolepsy will experience during an attack are, the mandatory increased tendency to fall asleep during daytime activities, and cataplexy, the sudden episode of muscle weakness or paralysis, but also other symptoms like hypnagogic hallucinations, vivid dream-like sensations that occur just while dozing or drifting off to sleep. These hallucinations may manifest in the form of visual or auditory sensations, or both. Those vivid dreams may be experienced on a regular basis, even during brief naps. On the other hand, if the same trippy kind of shit happens while awakening from sleep, it is then referred as hypnopompic hallucinations. Those hallucinations, along with cataplexy, sleep paralysis and the excessive daytime sleepiness constitute the tetrad of narcolepsy. Tetrad meaning a group of four. In this case, a group of four, undesirable, traits. Narcoleptic people will also experience a whole variety of other symptoms. This may include nighttime wakefulness, disrupted sleep pattern like abnormal REM sleep, aka rapid eye movement sleep, that's a fancy name for the dreaming state. She's into REMs now. She's definitely dreaming now. But also segmented sleep at night, the same way they have trouble maintaining wakefulness during the day, they will struggle maintaining sleep through the night. Actually, people with narcolepsy tend to sleep as much as people without, but the quality of sleep tends to be lessened. Because they may not be able to get the right amount of restorative deep REM sleep like anyone else, their brains will then try to catch up during the day. Likewise people may remain conscious throughout the whole episode, or sometimes they can display automatic behaviors. That's when there's a brief sleep episode during random activity. Like eating or writing. Like hitting the pause button for a few seconds or minutes, and then automatically continuing without any conscious awareness of WTF just happened. Narcoleptic people are, as well more likely to undergo sleep paralysis, that's some kind of paralysis, happening during sleep, but for more about that, check our full episode, link up there. The excessive daytime sleepiness thing generally persists throughout life but sleep paralysis and hypnagogic situations may not. The mechanisms of narcolepsy happen in the different part of the brain dealing with arousal, wakefulness and sleep. But most of these arousal promoting signals come from very special type of brain cells in the lateral hypothalamus, the orexin neurons. These orexin neurons send connections throughout the whole front part of the brain, and as they have an excitatory effect, they will help turn on the cortex and most parts of the brain involved with wakefulness and suppressing REM sleep. This is the way. The orexin neurons are a really critical collection of brain cells that produce a very particular and special neurotransmitter known as orexin, which can be sometimes referred as hypocretin. 
that are just two names for the same chemical. Like adrenaline can be referred as epinephrine. The brain contains somewhere around between 1 and 200,000 of those orexin slash hypocretin producing neurons. Which could sound like a lot, but remember that the brain holds a total of 86 billions of neurons, so that's quite a small number. Orexin is a neuropeptide, that's a chemical messenger made of a small chain of amino acids, and it acts within the brain to regulate a number of cognitive and physiological processes, in this case wakefulness. The system that regulates arousal, sleep, and all the transitional state shits in between, is composed of three interconnected subsystems. The reticular activating system, Google it, the ventrolateral preoptic nucleus, and of course, those orexin neuron projections from the lateral hypothalamus. And those three subsystems can be clearly impaired in case of a high orexin projections depletion. Orexin neurons are also supposed to consolidate wakefulness and suppress sleep cataplexy by activating noradrenergic neurons in the locus coeruleus, which results in arousal, alertness and vigilance or some shit. But during cataplexy periods, locus coeruleus neurons remain totally offline. Orexin neurons interact as well with the raphe nuclei, a serotonin-producing cluster of neurons, which is highly involved in circadian rhythm. I guess you can tell there's a connection here. But when you look closely, I mean very closely, at someone with narcolepsy, there's about a 90-95% to loss of those hypocretin-producing neurons. I guess you can tell there's a connection here. So as in narcolepsy, these hypocretin-producing cells die off, there's a massive failure to sustain regular activity in the wake-promoting brain regions across the day. The excitatory effects of those orexin neurons also play a key part in suppressing REM sleep. For instance, in narcoleptic individuals, there's significantly fewer orexin neuropeptides floating around in cerebrospinal fluid and neural tissues, compared to non-narcoleptic people. During normal REM sleep, aka the dreaming level, there's reflex inhibition of the motor system, usually resulting in the protective paralysis mechanism occurring during sleep because you don't want to act out your dreams, right? But the loss of orexin neurons leads to deficiencies in regulating this protective paralysis, and keeping it only for night purposes. Thus, this inappropriately activated sleep systems will result in people going straight into REM sleep during daytime wakefulness. Instead of going through the usual period of slow wave sleep, which lasts for about the first hour or so of a regular sleep cycle. Simply put, the brain doesn't go through the normal stages of dozing and then deeper sleep and so on, instead it goes directly into, and out of, rapid eye movement sleep. Some people can even dream even when falling asleep for a few seconds. This dysregulation of REM sleep paralysis, causing a mismatch of timing between wakefulness and REM sleep, is also thought to be the basis for cataplexy. Cataplexy, that can be sometimes mistaken for a seizure or epilepsy, can start with slurred speech, sometimes with unimpaired hearing, vision and awareness. This episodic loss of muscle function, can range from slight sagging weaknesses in the neck, knees or facial muscle, to a complete, total body collapse. These very weaknesses in the knees are referred as knee buckling. Cataplexy may often be severe enough to cause anyone to slam on the ground while unable to move or even speak, despite sometimes remaining conscious. That's the main distinction between sleep paralysis and cataplexy. The first happens when naturally falling asleep, while cataplexy is physically irresistible, and is triggered by weird emotional shit during any random daytime activities. Several factors may cause this loss of orexin-producing neurons, hence causing narcolepsy. It can be genetic, because specific variations of the human leukocyte antigen complex, or HLA complex for short, that's an area in chromosome 6, mellow the fuck out, so some variations on these HLA genes, are strongly correlated with narcolepsy. For those who want to go even deeper into this quagmire of genetic hodgepodge, variations of some allele of the gene HLA DQB1 is reported in more than 90% of narcoleptic people. These very genetic variations on this HLA complex thing will increase the risk of an autoimmune response against orexin neurons. This selective destruction of orexin neurons in the lateral hypothalamus, but the preservation of proximate neighboring structures, suggests a highly specific autoimmune pathophysiology. Despite remaining not fully understood, the cause for this targeted loss of orexin neurons in narcolepsy is indeed attributable to an autoimmune mechanism. A combination, as always, of genetic and environmental factors, will result in an inflammatory reaction in the brain, this will then cause an immune-mediated destruction of orexin neurons, resulting in all the symptoms of narcolepsy I have been listing my ass off earlier. Furthermore, according to UCLA research, so it seems legit, but I failed to find deeper sources. Narcolepsy is, or can be, also associated with a very large increase in the number of neurons producing histamine, another wake-promoting neurotransmitter. Histamine doesn't just make you itch. It's also an arousal neurotransmitter, 
but it is thought to target orexin neurons during the inflammatory attack process. For instance, and according to their findings, during autopsies, UCLA's dead narcoleptic corpses had an average of 64% more histamine neurons. On a different note, people suffering from narcolepsy are more likely to gain excess weight, between 9 to 18 kilograms in childhood, during the first onsets of the condition, and a body mass index of around 15% above averages for adults. There is no definitive treatment for this condition, because medication evolves as our understanding of the disorder evolves. According to Harvard University, people should aim for an 8-hour sleep at night on a very regular schedule, nap when they can, avoid alcohol, sorry dudes. Narcoleptics should also stop smoking, keep a good exercise pattern, and they should limit drugs. Oops. If they stick to those habits, then, maybe then, nothing will really improve that much. But there's still medication. With tricyclic antidepressants or SSRIs to treat cataplexy, especially if it happens several times a day. And for the sleepiness side of narcolepsy, there's two classes of medication used to help people to stay awake. First, an old version of standard stimulants, which works well, but with nasty gnarly side effects. The second class being, some newer type of stimulant, but with less side effects, and less effects overall. Doctors will then try this one first, and if it's not effective enough, they'll come back to the older first medication. Treatments have to be adjusted as best as possible. It needs to be individual adapted, kinda tailor-made. People with narcolepsy will often require medication to try to control their sleepiness and cataplexy. In rare cases, narcolepsy can be resulting from tumors, brain injuries, or any other troubles affecting brain areas dealing with wakefulness or REM sleep. So more than ever, don't forget that more research is needed, and if only we could get hypocretin back in the brain, it would be like giving insulin to people with diabetes. And apparently, some people, when well treated, can almost live normal lives. But this debilitating condition may cause great distress, because more important than not being able to drive or swim, obviously, it can bring fear, extreme anxiety and of course, avoidance of social situation that might elicit an attack. So when left untreated, narcolepsy is likely to cause serious issues in a person's professional and personal life, as it is clearly socially disabling and isolating. Most of all, the symptoms of narcolepsy are out of character with one's personality, and they don't reflect any lazy-ass state of mind. Condensing me, man. Fucking kill you, man. It's not just sleepiness in boring classes or car rides. Narcoleptics are not, quote marks, oversleeping, they are just not able to get the amount of restorative deep sleep as regular people get because of abnormal REM sleep regulation. And that's it for this episode of Fact Heist, we hope we made it clear enough. What's so hard to get? You just need to have grown up in the 80s but still be a teenager. As usual, don't forget to like and subscribe or some bullshit like that. Peace out.